Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. When reports of ExxonMobil's divestment in Nigeria to the tune of $3 billion was published last week, the details were unclear. More details on the reasons for this decision by the American oil giant has been released. Joining us now to speak on this is energy finance expert, Dan Kunle. Thank you for coming to the morning show. Good morning. Morning, uh, Abati, and welcome back from the field. <laughs> <laughs> I hope uh, your I hope I hope I hope your people in your office receive you with uh, a lot of uh, they did, a lot with of, a lot uh, of enthusiasm and, uh, yes. and uh, encouragement. Yes. And encouragement. Yeah, yes, they did. Good. Great guys. Welcome and it back, was a yeah. useful experience Thank going out Thank there. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, um, yeah. yeah, you yeah. listened to my introduction. It's about what has been happening recently in the oil and gas uh, sector. Um, before ExxonMobil talked about yes. divestment yes. of its uh, onshore assets, uh, we had Shell uh, also uh, divesting and moving, concentrating on offshore exploration. Uh, what exactly is happening? Is it that uh, there are issues with taxation, <laughs> with community yes. relations, with yes. the governance framework within that sector that is moving uh, that is resulting in these divestments? Yes, uh, all of the above you have mentioned. You see, uh, Ruben, you see, the, 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 the situation is like this. The, the global economy is every day opening new frontiers. And if you go to recent history, say 500 years, which is very contemporary because you can trace 500 years history, you will see the, the role that oil has played in the last 500 years. Just don't use oil, just say energy. The energy hungry world, as the population of the world was imagined, if you take the global picture, you know the main thing that was driving the whole world was energy, energy, energy. So the world was energy hungry. And if you trace the history of the role America played in, uh, in uh, energy you, from 1834, when the colonel, not military colonel, uh, started uh, drilling for oil in America, and up to the point that they took crude to the University of Yale to crack crude from where they got kerosene, you know, which used to be called the illuminant. You will, from that moment, Till the time they went to Saudi Arabia, to Baghdad, to do exploration, to find oil. Till today, including Mosul, northern Iraq, you can see that the test for energy continue up to this moment. And you can see all the wars, First World War, Second World War, you can see they are energy driven, largely. They are energy, they are energy driven wars. So today, the new frontiers today, you can see we went from onshore to offshore to search for hydrocarbon because coal gave way. You remember the role coal played in England. The United Kingdom economy was built on coal, limestone, and steel. Okay, and the French, same. Okay, then from that phase, coal gave way. So oil became very dominant, and till today, you can see what Aramco just did recently. So now, oil is also going. The new frontier is gas. But you, the, the shift, the paradigm shift, is not going to be an easy one. We are going to have uh, winners, and we are going to have losers. So I hope Nigeria will not be a loser to come back home. So ExxonMobil, uh, they have weighed everything around them, including the Geotechnical study of United States of America. You know, United States of America, many people don't know, is a very vast country with different structures, substructures of the rock there. So they've discovered huge shale gas four or five kilometers below the, below the ground. So, and the technology to bring this shale oil and shale gas has been improved over the last 20 years to the extent that. It has become so efficient that they can produce so much at maybe below $25 per barrel, which is an expensive venture, actually, because Saudi Arabia still produces crude oil for about $5 or less than $5 per barrel. But 
within the uh, contents of your question, ExxonMobil has been playing about with their portfolios, uh, evaluating all their portfolios. That is investment and asset that they are holding across the world. And uh, new exploration, new frontiers in Mozambique, in, uh, in the Mediterranean. So they've, they've looked at Nigeria environment and said, look, what are we holding in Nigeria? What's the total asset we are holding in Nigeria? And what's the total asset we are sitting on in America? So is there any competitive advantage we are deriving sitting in Nigeria? Yes or no? So the answer is there for you and me. So their decision is well calibrated before it was taken. You know, they are very scientific. They subjected everything, including those issues you mentioned, those variables you mentioned, political, economic, uh, geography, uh, so many factors, you know, even attitude, attitude in a, the culture of Nigeria, attitude, the attitude of the, of the community, <coughs> the attitude of Nigerians. Do we have the right attitude for industrialization? Do we have the right attitude for investment? So all these issues, do we have the right banking infrastructure? Do we have the right law? Do we have the right taxation policies? So all these issues they have weighed. And they just felt, look, let us take our money, go to a new frontier in Mozambique, take our money to go to uh, shale gas in America. You know what uh, Konoko Phillips did in 2013, 2014, they divested from brass LNG and they took their money. I think Oando bought their, their, their share. Mm -hmm. And they took their money to America to invest in uh, shale and oil. And they are doing better there <laughs> now because they are at home. Okay. They are at home, they are in their comfort zone. You know? so, so these are the issues. So ExxonMobil must have done their homework. I'm not happy for Nigeria because I want my country to be industrialized. But uh, if the attitude is not yet there, both, both uh, the society, so what can I do? I well, well that, that brings me... We have to live with all these things that we cannot... Yeah. That brings me to the next question, yes, because uh, the divestment we are seeing from these IOCs uh, does present an opportunity for local firms, doesn't it? However, these challenges that you have mentioned would persist for the local firms. And let me ask you if you think that the indigenous uh, uh, firms have the capabilities to take up these assets. Yes. Uh, now, let's go back to this issue of indigenous. What is the, what is the infrastructural base for indigenous groups in Nigeria to do well? I have been, I have been around the corner in this country watching events and development since in the 1970s. The development plan by Professor Adedeji, late Adedeji. Uh, the, 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 the rolling plans, uh, and uh, I have seen that the indigenous group, uh, every time they want to come up in the, in the civil and construction engineering in this country, they could not. They want to come up in uh, oil and gas. Uh, I've been part of this in recent time. It has not been easy. You see success rate is very low among the indigenous group. The failure rate is very high. I can say almost 90% failure rate because uh, if you take all the oil companies in Lagos that are indigenous, see how many of them that are doing well on the stock exchange. And those that have not even listed on the stock exchange, if you go near them, uh, it's not palatable. So the, the banking infrastructure is not there. So the capital formation is very weak. The culture of the Nigerian people themselves does not allow for uh, proper capitalism. The culture is a wasteful culture. So I don't see the group, the group that, the, the, the indigenous group that can have a head on uh, start off with huge assets, like the experience of Shell. Take all the OML4 to OML30, all those oil mining licenses that Shell divested from OML29, uh, what, what is, have we been able to measure performances of the indigenous group? And how much financial backing are they getting? How much incentives are the government giving them? What we call deliberate incentives to encourage growth. Deliberate incentive, underline that word. Because you cannot record growth in developing economy unless you give some deliberate incentives. So, uh, yes. 
there are still some ambitious Nigerians around us, young ones, but the ambition must be carefully crafted this time around because uh, some of these assets, <coughs> people are making a mistake. If the oil price is 68 today, if the oil price is $68 today, in one year, two years' time, what will the oil price be? Because if you remember when Shell was divesting from 2010 to 2014, the oil price looks very good, and then immediately they finished divesting, the oil price started crashing. So all the indigenous companies that acquired very high prices, they lost money. We all lost money, straight. Nobody, there is no cushion, nobody to rescue us. So I think one must be very guided. I believe there are some young people, some companies in Lagos, in Abuja, in Poraco that may want to buy this asset, but they should be very guided. They should be very guided in their investment uh, decision. It's not, oil is not going to be the, 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 golden, the golden commodity of the future at all. So gas, yes. Uh, knowledge and data, yes. These are, the, these are the future. Knowledge, data, yes. Gas, yes, because you still need energy to power the world. Okay, and gas is going to do that. So oil, uh, not, not completely bad, but it's not going to be the, it's not going to be the ruling uh, energy elements anymore. So I think, uh, let, let, let's see what play out. Let's see what pan out. I, I'm, not, I'm not pessimistic. I'm still very optimistic that there is a big opportunity in this market, 180 million people. So I, I believe uh, some, some groups are working already to try to, to, to acquire some of this asset, but I want them to be guided. We you had know, uh, Femi Fallon on SCN. We had Femi Fallon on SCN on this program uh, recently. And he even wrote an article to the effect that uh, all these oil licenses, mining leases, should be cancelled by the uh, federal government of Nigeria, including joint venture agreements. Because as far as he is concerned, uh, this is just a case of handing over Nigerians, Nigeria's wealth to a few individuals, and that it is even unconstitutional to do so. <laughs> that it should be the federal government and the state governments taking direct ownership of uh, uh, assets in the energy sector. Uh, we had a long conversation around this, but. What, what do you think? Very good. I'm, I'm very happy that you brought this issue. You see, Fermi Falano is, <laughs> is a lawyer, he's a constitutional lawyer, he's an advocate, he's a, an activist. So uh, he's a socialist by tendencies. Every tendency is a socialist. I think he wants to nationalize the oil resource, oil and gas resource of Nigeria. That is very good. That, that is very good. Uh, let's try it. You see, there is no experience that is uh, bad in undertaking, particularly a country like Nigeria that has been trying all sorts of things. In my lifetime, from the 1970s today, we have tried so many things, and none, none was pursued to a logical conclusion, you know. We tried to build steel. We could not do it with the Russians. We tried to own crude oil refineries. We could not do it. We try to, everything we have tried to do, we try to, to run railway, we could not run railway, we could not run airways. So if now he said we should hand, they should hand over all the, all the oil assets in Nigeria back to government, state and federal. What has federal government and state run successfully in Nigeria? Tell me one. The most successful um, uh, business in Africa today is Boni LNG, Nigeria LNG Boni doing 22 million tons of liquefied uh, gas. And it's 51% controlled by Shell, Total, and Ajib, and 49% owned by federal government. So, I, so now, you, you, Femi is telling me now, Femi is telling the whole world that, okay, let Shell sell his, uh, return his 51% back to federal government and state, let them run the LNG. So <laughs> let them, let federal government and the state now operate all the oil fields, yes, it could work in countries like Saudi Arabia, where the monarch was the architect and the driver of the capitalism in Saudi Arabia, because it's a kingdom. It could work in United Arab Emirates. But when, it, but when you see the structure of those companies, you will see again, it's still real capitalism. 
Uh, but here, if you hand over all this asset to the state, don't, ever, don't let us even look at the legal implications that you are going to have. So you can decree it. Uh, the National Assembly can pass a law and, and revoke Petroleum Act uh, 1969. They can also, all the mining ordinances, uh, they can also re re repeal them. Yes, but what is going to happen to you in the international arena? Every joint venture contract, you are going to have to, there are exit clauses. So how are you going to? <laughs> mm -hmm. But let, let's try it. Let's try it. After all, even all the companies that have been privatized, let, let's federal government renationalize them. I mean, there is nothing wrong. There, let us try all these experiences. We are just doing ourselves, and we think we are doing somebody. So we, we think we are, we are playing uh, smart. So let's try it, hmm. and let's see how uh, 180 million people are going to, to manage themselves. Let's try it. Let's go back. Let's go back to state control, what we call the command era, where the state owns restaurants, the state owns Transcorp Hilton, where I am sitting now. When I privatized, I was involved in the privatization of Nikon Hilton and Sheraton. When you see the bill that federal government were owing, they will put civil servant there. They will not pay. Two, three months, four months, they won't pay. So let's go back to that era. Let's nationalize everything. Nationalize electricity. Nationalize uh, the all the oil resources. It's good. So the, st the state, uh, Kogi State, I'm from Kogi State, so Ajakuta steel will be controlled by the state governor. If he has money, he can, he can produce steel and look for market. So <laughs> well, that, that's one look, issue you're not optimistic uh, so about. <laughs> yeah, definitely, you're uh, obviously not optimistic about that. But let me bring your attention to what is making the front pages today. I don't know if you've uh, seen the report, the World Bank ban all economic report in Nigeria talking about payment of subsidy for 2018, uh, over 700 billion naira. Did that come as a surprise to you? No. I'm aware of what is going on in the uh, subsidy regime. I'm aware, in the, I'm aware about what is going on in the, in the upstream sector of the economy. I'm aware of what is going on in the downstream. Our import regime, our refineries, I, I am aware. The, even that figure. They are just being conservative. The wastages alone is in excess of 300 billion naira. The wastages in the import regime of uh, refined products is in excess of $1 billion, the wastages. Which, the, when I use the word wastages here, I mean the quantum of inefficiency in the import arrangement for fuel and handling. That's what I mean by wastages. So I'm sure the World Bank is even calculating just the price of how much you buy a liter from outside the refinery, and then freight insurance to a papa or to an airport, then uh, other handling costs. But when you see the inefficiency, now let me, if you have luxury of times, what do I mean by it? this subsidy is very embarrassing, but we have to live with it, because uh, when you talk like uh, a market economy, in Nigeria, everybody already look at you as uh, you, you want to privatize the country. The, the subsidy regime, I will give you an example. You have three and a half refineries in Nigeria owned by government. So now none is working up to 30% capacity, installed capacity. So you have to take your crude. Nigeria have comparative advantage to produce crude oil because you have it under your ground. But you don't have competitive advantage to refine crude oil. So when you produce the crude oil, the international oil companies, IOC, produce the crude oil largely. You take it out, you take your own portion out to a refinery in Spain or somewhere in the Mediterranean or somewhere in the, in the Atlantic basin. You go and refine it. So you pay freight and insurance too. Then you refine it, you bring refined products back. You pay insurance and freight back, then you pay storage, handling and storage at the port. Now, I give you, the inefficiency comes from here. You have shallow ports in Nigeria. Apapa and Tinkan are shallow ports. So they cannot handle very large vessels, 
that can take huge volumes of refined products. So you are going to bring small, small vessels. So your economy of scale, you are losing money. On every liter, you are losing money already. So then when you offload this petrol, all your tank farms are not efficient because they are not all connected by pipes. So how much volume can you pressurize through the pipes before the pipes is busted somewhere or somebody attacked the pipe somewhere? So you are going to truck, you are going to start trucking all these imported products. By the time you do what we call the add-on cost, value additions, add-on cost, every handling has cost. And then very inefficient handling because you don't have good road, you don't have railway. So when you add up everything, well, you are talking of 1.1 trillion. So this is their figure of 700 billion. It, we, okay, we are not here to dispute their figure, but it, it's, it's embarrassing enough, but that is part of the baggage we have to carry for operating a, 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 a subsidy regime that looks uh, impossible to get away from because we don't just have the right uh, policy decision to get away from it. So it's unfortunate, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Let us live with it like this. We have to live with it. We we'll live with it. Well, still on the, the uh, such time. still on the World Bank yeah. report. Yeah. Uh, the World Bank in that yeah. uh, report uh, was more or less also drawing attention to massive corruption in the petroleum sector. Uh, there was a reference to underperformance, low productivity resulting in part from other issues like discretionary deductions, depletion of the excess crude account, um, subsidy on foreign exchange conversion rates. Uh, how do we address all of that? Because now that uh, we have a budget benchmark of $60, and <laughs> Brent Light, see, uh, as at this uh, model, was $71. Ruben I'm, happy, Ruben, I'm happy you were in presidency. Yes. You were in presidency. I'm happy you were in presidency. You see, the... the, the the, the petroleum accounting of Nigeria is, uh, let, us, let us separate something. The activities of the international oil companies upstream, they do exploration, they do exploitation. That is exploration, they search for oil within the oil mining leases that they were given. Okay. They have a structure, accounting structure. Now, the financial architecture of oil and gas in the upstream is in the hand of the international oil companies. The template used is created by them because it's a global standard. Okay. Now, you also now have the midstream. When they produce the oil, the accounting is there, up there. Shell, Chevron, all of them, they have the accounting system, the record of what they produce, how much is being produced daily at what cost, oil cost, and all the add-ons. Now, in the joint ventures, they have joint operating account. So when people make statements like there is a sweeping corruption in, the, in this business, I want them to isolate each segment of the, of the value chain of the oil production in Nigeria. Take the upstream, diagonize it, and then you look at it. If there are leakages in the crude handling, crude export, crude accounting, you can find a way to address that. There may be leakages, I cannot say with authority. Okay. Then you come down to the midstream. Midstream is how many refineries are taking crude and refining them and taking the product to the market. So how much quantity of of crude are they taking per day? Where are they taking it to for refining? At what cost? So, and what is government getting out of it? That you can see is a little bit opaque because even from what has been said over and over, like the World Bank report, it's very difficult up to now to show the true account of how much crude oil you are taking per day to feed the three refineries. And every, everybody knows it's 445,000 barrels per day. That is the capacity of the three refineries, uh, the three and a half refineries. But is that what we take out to refine and bring the product back? So how do we measure the products? 
that come out of these 445,000 barrels? How do we measure the product? The condensate, the, L, the liquefied petroleum gas, the, the grease, the paraffin wax, the everything that comes out of that barrel, a barrel of crude oil. How do we, how do we account for it? Because a, a, a crude, a barrel of a crude oil does not mean when you refine it, it is only PMS you are going to get out of it. No, you are going to get diesel, you are going to get kerosene, you are going to get paraffin wax, you are going to get sulfur, you are going to get so many things depending on the grade of the oil. <laughs> so now, all those questions, I don't know, we have brilliant people, well qualified, that are managing all these things, but I don't know if we have the right attitude, the right culture, to transparently manage these things. So these are the suspicious issues that you see World Bank is always raising because they have this helicopter view over our activities across the world. I mean the World Bank and IMF. So when they make statements at times, it's left for you not to be mentally lazy. You must dig into what they say, dig into it and check the veracities of some of these things. So at times you see 50-50. They are correct. It's not just, there cannot be smoke without fire somewhere. But I, I'm not, I don't have the authority here to say exactly how much quantum of money we are losing. But definitely we are losing money to ineptitude, ineptitude, attitude, and, and carelessness. Well, thank you very uh, much. I don't like using the word corruption, corruption. Uh, you know, discretion is one of the most dangerous uh, 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 dangerous privilege a man can ever have when you have discretion. The discretion with which we manage our oil resources in Nigeria, it, it, it calls for a lot of questioning. So that is just all. I don't want to go into details. Thank you very much, uh, Dan Kunle, and thank you for uh, <laughs> obliging us. Thank you very much indeed.